You are about to see a really rare moment where Jordan Peterson presses the topic of Jesus to Ben Shapiro and begins to explain the difference between Christianity and Judaism. The conversation gets really interesting and some really deep things get brought up that Jordan Peterson even says is very complicated. I'm going to let this one play out until the end and then I'm going to give some of my responses, but I encourage you to stick around until then because I'm going to fill in some of the gaps that didn't get filled, I believe, in some of Ben Shapiro's logic about Christianity itself. Let's dig in. And this is, this is where I think we could have an interesting conversation about the relationship between Judaism and Christianity. So there's an idea in Christianity, which is I think the central idea, which is that you need to face the potential for malevolence that exists within you and in the world. So that's Christ's confrontation with the devil in the desert with Satan in the desert. You have to come to terms with that malevolence, that's part of existence. And you have to voluntarily accept the burden of suffering. And so that's the acceptance of the cross. Okay, so you take on that, you say the suffering, so there's an idea that Christ is a messianic figure because he took the suffering of the world onto himself. And what that means to me is that he was someone, speaking um, conceptually, who decided that the suffering of the world was his responsibility, mm -hmm. and that that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to decide that that's your responsibility. You take that on a bur as a burden. You do the same with the malevolence. So when you read history, you read history as a perpetrator, right? Maybe you also read it as a victim, but you certainly read it as a perpetrator. And then that's on you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then the question is, what happens when you do that? And I would say the answer is two things, is that, first of all, it starts to force you to develop, like to learn what you need to learn in the world and to absorb the information that would enable you to start to face the suffering and to rectify it. So that forces you to become a more competent person and that's the socialization part that you thought of as so important. But then there's a secondary thing that happens too, which is that taking on that additional stress and demand voluntarily transforms you biologically because within your genetic structure, let's say. There's all sorts of potential, but that won't be unlocked unless you place yourself in a position where the demands necessitate it. And so by following that pathway, truth, let's say, the acceptance of suffering and the confrontation with malevolence, so that's the heaviest load that you could take on, then you actually produce a psychophysiological slash spiritual transformation in yourself that matures you into like the representation of the Father on Earth. That's why that that's how that lays so, itself okay, so out. I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad he got us here because the question that I said to you, I, there was only one thing I said to you guys before yeah, yeah. we started that I wanted to get to something about most of the lectures that you're, when we're doing these things, you're usually talking about the Old Testament. Now, obviously, you're an Old Testament guy. I'm on But my, my question was, do you think that Ben, or, or just people that believe in the Old Testament exclusively, are missing something? So you just laid out a case of something that potentially is missing so there. Do you think that argue. is a I'm fair argue. argument? Well, what I'm going to argue is that what you just said is fundamentally unchristian, in the sense that you're saying that everyone is supposed to imitate Jesus, and the basic conceit of, from what I understand, uh, speaking with Christian theologians, is that we are fundamentally incapable of taking on our own sin, and so we have to have somebody who comes in the form of Christ on earth in order to accept that suffering for us, and that that is the purpose of God actually embodying himself in Christ, is to provide human beings the capacity to withdraw from original sin, that we don't actually have the capacity hmm. beyond a certain point to overcome, and that's why Jesus as a singular figure is necessary. I actually agree from a Judaic point of view with everything that you say, because for me it's about accepting the responsibility for my own sins on myself, and I don't have the ability to say that there is the, the suffering servant, the suffering Lamb of God, who sacrificed himself to relieve me of my sins, mm -hmm. and therefore give me a fair shot at life. Yeah, well, uh, okay, so, okay, that's a, that's a really good objection, I think, and I think that there's a fair bit of confusion about that in the Christian community, for example, so I would say that that perspective is more explicitly Protestant, and then then I would put the Catholics next to that, but then I would put the Orthodox types fairly far away from that, which is why so many Orthodox Christians, I think, have been interested in what I'm saying, because their sense, and this is where my knowledge of Christian theology starts to run out, because mm -hmm. like, I'm not an expert on, you know, in, the, in the doctrinal differences. Right. Um, their sense is that it's the imitation that's of primary importance. 
Now, mm -hmm. it's, it's a weird thing because even in classical Christianity, you have, let, let's say, Protestant Christianity, you have this idea that, well, Christ died to save us all from our sins, and so we're already redeemed. But that doesn't alleviate the moral burden, weirdly mm -hmm. enough, because you'd think it should. So there's this paradox. And I think it's, I, I think part of the reason for that, uh, this, is, this is an extraordinarily complicated thing, but in, in, in the Brothers Karamazov, Christ comes back to earth. Right. And um, in Seville during the Spanish Inquisition, and so he's doing his miracles and raising people <coughs> from the dead and like being all messianic. And right. the first thing that happens is the Inquisitor arrests him, right. throws him in prison, and then comes to visit him and basically says, look, um, the last thing we need after setting up this church for 2,000 years is you. You're a lot of trouble. You've put a moral burden on human beings that's too much for them to bear. And so what we've done is watered it down and put some intermediaries in place so that the moral demand that your example required doesn't just crush people into nothingness, right? So every ideal is a judge. Right. So then you have the ultimate ideal, that's the ultimate judge. And from the Inquisitor's point of view, that judge was too much. Mm -hmm. It was too right. demanding. And so I think there's an, and so, so anyway, so the Inquisitor goes through all this argument and says we're going to have to, keep, you know, get rid of you again because right. <laughs> you're you're just too much to bear mm -hmm. and so Christ listens and doesn't says any doesn't say anything and then just when the inquisitor stands to leave Christ kisses him on the lips and he, the inquisitor mm -hmm. turns white in shock and then leaves but he leaves the door open and that's the brilliant uh, that's the brilliant ending of of Dostoevsky's piece the Grand inquisitor, and, yeah. yeah and it, what makes him such a genius because he basically says something like well look the the Catholic Church did reduce the burden, and it is corrupt in the way that earthly organizations are likely to be corrupt. And it does allow an out, which is, well, you can put your sins on Christ, let's say, and that alleviates your moral burden, but it still keeps the damn door open. Well, this and is, that's, so th this is why I think it's really fascinating, having, having spent a lot of time with Christian theologians in the past couple of years writing this book, is that the, the original conceit, I think, when, when, when you talk with people who are Christian and Jewish and you have sort of interfaith conversations, uh, the original one-sentence conceit and the difference between them is that what you hear from Jews is Judaism is acts-based and Christianity is faith-based. Uh, Christianity is about the acceptance of Christ. When you accept Christ, then you've accepted what you need to accept and everything flows therefrom. Mm -hmm. And Judaism says it's not just about accepting God, it's all these mitzvot, right? There are all these commandments that you have to do, and these are what perfect you as a human being. It's, it's the performance of these commandments, accepting God's sovereignty, because he's the one who gave the commandments, but you actually have to act in the world, and if you don't mm -hmm. act in the world, then you haven't fulfilled your responsibility in the world. Th and this could also be an argument why you could have, although I know you wouldn't be thrilled them yeah. in per se, you could have Jewish atheists in that they believe that it's just their actions here. Yes, 100%. Yeah. So, so th this is why you know Jews have had very, and, and I think most Christians believe this too, the idea of having a moral atheist is not really a difficult idea. Yeah. It's the idea of having a system built on atheism that's completely immoral and will fall apart almost immediately. And the idea of having a moral system built on atheism, if you examine your atheism closely enough, I think falls apart. I think that moral atheism is basically you separating your morality from your atheism and then ignoring your atheism in pursuit of the morality, which is, well, you can live fine that way, that's fine, but I don't think that that's psychologically sustainable um, in, if you actually examine the core of your ideas. But with, with that said, I think that Christianity, after its original millenarian viewpoint, when, when Christianity first came about, the idea of Christ on earth was that he had ushered in the messianic era because this was, it was, it was a new era, it was a new day. Mm -hmm. And then it turns out that people looked around and went, well, this looks a lot like the old day, right? right, not, right. not that much has changed. Mm -hmm. And so what changed? What changed was our spiritual status. That was the new redefinition of the messianic era is that the, the, what Christ had brought to earth was a new spirit, right? He he'd yep. brought a new spirit into the earth and he'd, he'd cleansed people of their sins and given them a fresh shot at life, basically. Yep. Uh, and that in doing so, he'd changed the nature of, of how things work. Well, Judaism basically said, well, we never thought that that nature changed in the first place, right? That's, that's, that's something different. And so, ironically enough, I think one of the sources of Christian anti-Semitism over time is an attempt to distinguish what makes Christianity different from Judaism other than Christ. Because Christianity and Judaism, in most of their main philosophies, have an awful lot in common. It's interesting. I just interviewed um, a, uh, a fellow named John MacArthur, who's a major pastor, major Christian theologian. I interviewed him a couple of days ago for our Sunday special. And this came up. I asked him, so where do you think the differences are between Christianity and Judaism? And he basically said, Jesus. Right? That's the difference. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is the mostly honest answer, because when I hear Christian theologians try to distinguish Judaism from Christianity, 
what they say about Judaism I find to be not accurate as to what Judaism actually says. And when I hear Jews try to distinguish Christianity from Judaism, I think that, well, and I'm not saying they're the same thing, mm -hmm. because they're not, obviously, they're different belief systems, but in terms of the underlying value system, the reason that we say Judeo-Christian value system is because in terms of the value system itself, the commonalities are overwhelming. They're overwhelming. The differences are mostly doctrinal and historical, and in terms of what you think, God, I, I think that Christians read back in an Acts-based version of their own lives, through a variety of mechanisms, whether they say, well, predestination exists, but in order to show that if I were really elect, I would be acting this way, right? That is an acts based mm -hmm. version. It's just retroactive mm -hmm. from the end. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this is why if you say to a Christian, so you really believe that you can lead a terribly dissolute, awful, terrible life, but if you believe in Christ with the full fiber of your being, you're going to heaven? And they'll so, say, well, but, well, and, and many of them will say yes, but then you say, but what makes a good person? And they'll say, right, not, but if, uh, and right, what they'll always add, but if you believe in Christ, you wouldn't do all those things. Now, there was a lot said right there, but I want to start from the top. Jordan says this, I'm quoting from him. There is an idea in Christianity, which is that you need to face the potential malevolence within you, or AKA the evil within you, and that you have to voluntarily accept the burden of suffering, which is the acceptance of the cross. So in other words, Jordan is getting at, you must acknowledge you are a sinner and take responsibility for it by turning to the Lord and denying yourself and picking up your cross and following Jesus daily, which is what Jesus said, essentially in Luke 9, 23. He says, if you want to be my disciple, you must deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me daily. This is really important to understand. And there's some more depth to this thought. And this is something that actually confused the Ben, as Jordan began to try to expound upon this true truth that's within the Bible, and Ben says this, I quote, what you just said is fundamentally unchristian. And then in so many words, Ben expounds upon how, based off of his understanding of Christianity, that the Christian is incapable of taking upon themselves the responsibility to deal with their sin, and this is why they need a Savior, a.k.a. Jesus who died for their sins. Now, Ben believes he's making a good point here, but it's rooted in a misconception about Christians' relationship with sin sin after they've been born again. But before I break that down, Jordan actually tries to. I quote, Jordan says, in Protestant Christianity, you have this idea that Christ died to save us from our sins. So we're already redeemed, but that doesn't alleviate the moral burden, weirdly enough, because you think it should, so there's a paradox. And as Jordan thinks about what he's saying, he says, this is an extraordinarily complicated Thing. And when I first heard this interview, I started laughing at this moment because it can be very complicated. And this is what I want to dive into because I think this is what went over Ben's head and he honestly has a misconception about. Um, and what I believe Jordan seems to be wrestling with right here and explaining is something called sanctification. Now, the theological way of expounding upon our progression through salvation or our progression through the stages of salvation is by usually using three theological words or terms. It's justification, then sanctification, and then glorification. Or in other words, we are saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. Another way to explain this is justification has to do with being liberated from the penalty of sin. Sanctification has to do with being liberated from the power of sin. And glorification has to do with being liberated from the presence of sin. Now, let's go deeper. Listen to this. This is something I wrote a while back. This is how it works. Once one puts their faith in Jesus and surrenders their life over to him, they in turn are saved and justified. In other words, all because of grace, working through faith, their relationship with God has been restored due to the fact that they have been forgiven of all sin through Jesus and faith in him and made righteous and holy in his sight. One way to remember what justified means is to think about it like like this, just as if I'd never sinned. Crazy. All this has been a made all this has been made available to us because of Jesus, but that's not the end of the story. 
Next, God invites us into the process of sanctification. During this stage of our progression, we are being saved, or in other words, liberated from the darkness and lies through the renewing of our minds as the Holy Spirit energizes the very words of God to wash us in every way. That's a mouthful. Let me say it one more time. This is really important. During the stage of our progression, we are being saved, or in other words, liberated from darkness and lies through the renewing of our minds as the Holy Spirit energizes the very words of God to wash us in every way. In this stage, we can experience His truth, aka His word, and His Spirit, aka the Holy Spirit, set us free from the powers of sin and darkness. Now, although freedom is available to us in this stage of sanctification, we still, of course, can feel the pushback of our physical humanness, aka our physical bodies, or what the Bible calls the flesh. So in order to continually progress in this stage of sanctification, one needs to continually deny themselves and look to Jesus with faith. Faith is key. Faith is key to the progression of sanctification. Now, although this can be a struggle sometimes because of the contrary des- because of the contrary desires of the flesh or aka the physical body, we have hope because one day we will be saved and experience glorification. This is the last stage where our physical bodies will be transformed and completely liberated from all of sins influence. Now there's so much scripture that is laced into what I just said and I'm going to let scripture just as I'm speaking kind of come up on the screen that you can look up for yourself and begin to dig into this because it's a very deep topic. Now Let's go deeper, if you'd bear with me, because I really want to fill in some of these gaps that I believe Ben has in his own thinking about Christians and their relationship with sin. Now, if you study Romans chapters 6, 7, and 8 with the theological framework that Paul, I believe, had within himself because he wrote in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 that we are spirit, soul, and body. I believe he had this theological framework of the Christian being spirit, soul, and body uh, as he wrote Romans 6 and 7 and 8, these three chapters. Now, when you dive into these three chapters with that theological framework that we're spirit, soul, and body, you will see it explain our relationship with sin in this life after we've entered into relationship with Jesus by faith and have been essentially born again. It works like this. Spiritually, Romans 6, it says that you are free from sin. But Romans 7, it it talks about our body. And physically, we're still a slave to sin. But Romans 8 speaks about our soul, our mind. And it says in Romans 8, 6, when the mind is set on the flesh, it's death. But the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. See, when the mind or the soul fixes its gaze on the spirit, then the spirit can take control of the body. It's called self-control. It's a fruit of of the spirit. Now that might sound like a mouthful, but the way this works is when I get born again, after I put faith in Jesus, I get born again. Second Corinthians 5, 17, it says, whoever's in Christ is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, the new has come. And Jesus again alludes to this born again reality in John 3, 3. And ex and not Exodus, but Ezekiel even prophesies about this a little bit where he says in that day, and he's speaking about Jesus' day. He says, in that day, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. See, when you get born again, it's a it's, an, it's a spiritual experience. It's a rebirth of who you are spiritually. And in this moment, you receive a new heart and a new spirit. And your spirit is liberated from sin. Your heart is sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. It says this, it says this in Hebrews 10, 22. And now you are essentially not only set free from the penalty of sin, but you are now introduced to begin to walk free from the power of sin because spiritually you've been liberated from its power. It says this in Romans 6, 6. It says, we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed so that we might no longer be enslaved to sin. And that word destroyed right there in Greek is katergeo, and it means to deprive of power. The sinful nature that used to lurk within the depths 
essence of who you were has been deprived of its power because you've been born again and you're one in spirit with Jesus. 1 Corinthians 6, 17, it says, those who are joined to the Lord are one spirit with him. Because of this oneness with Jesus spiritually, you now have the capacity to begin to rule over sin instead of being ruled by it. Now, that doesn't mean you don't feel the influence of it. And that's because of the flesh, the human body that you still have. See, one day we're going to experience glorification where we receive a new incorruptible body that is eternal and liberated completely from the presence of sin. The sin nature will no longer lurk within our new bodies. But our old bodies right now, this body that we have, this earth suit, our physical human is, is still a slave to sin. That's why if I cut myself, I bleed. That's why sometimes I still get sick. That You see it even in creation itself. Things decay. That's why it says in Romans 8 that all of creation is groaning. They want to be liberated. Creation itself wants to be liberated from sin and be restored back to its original uh, everlasting state where it was a thing that was permanent. It didn't die. It didn't decay. Decay and death didn't enter the world until sin did after Adam and Eve sinned. That's a long topic that, that I'll give another video to dive into. But I I hope you hear what I'm saying. So one day we're going to experience glorification where our bodies get liberated from the presence of sin. But right now, as we're dealing with this wrestle where spiritually I'm liberated from sin, but my physical body is still enslaved to sin, and I still feel what Peter describes in 1 Peter 2.11, he says, abstain from the desires of the flesh, the physical body, that wage war against your soul. Sometimes you're going to feel the sin nature that's connected to your flesh wage war against your soul, but you have the ability now, because you're born again, to instead incline your mind, Romans 8, 6, set your mind on the spirit instead of the flesh. Don't give in to the desires of the flesh that's trying to wage war against your soul and make you do things you shouldn't do as a Christian, but instead do what Jesus said, deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow him, aka set your mind on the spirit instead of the flesh, deny yourself, and instead set your mind on things above, Colossians 3, 1 through 3, or Romans 8, 6, set your mind on Jesus, or set your mind on the spirit. Hebrews 12, 2 says, fix your eyes on Jesus. These are all synonymous with each other. You you deny yourself and then you fix your eyes on him. And as you do, you will see the Holy Spirit give you the ability to tap into who you already are spiritually and he'll begin to impart the life of God into your mortal body and put to death the sin nature in your life right now. This is something you can experience in the process of sanctification right now. Why do I say all this? I'm literally quoting Romans 8, 11 through 13. Just to fast forward, Romans 8, 13, it literally says, if you live according to the flesh, the physical body, and live according to the sin, or, or live according to the sin nature. That's what I'm trying to say. If you live according to the flesh, aka the sin nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. The Holy Spirit can give you power to overcome the flesh. So what Jordan Peterson is explaining about how we still have this uh, moral obligation to deny ourselves, to pick up our cross and follow Jesus, even though we've been forgiven of sin and liberated from its power, is actually spot on. He's hitting the mark. It's just hard to explain. And it might even be going over some of your heads. Another way that I explain this, to dumb it down like crazy, is with a metaphor. There was this one time I was talking to an atheist and I was explaining some of this and he was so confused. He was like, what are you talking about, dude? And I was like, man, this is so hard. God, help me try to explain this. And then a metaphor in that moment, I feel like supernaturally hit me. And I told him this. I was like, hey, imagine if God picked up a fish and transformed that fish miraculously into a bird. Now it's something entirely different. But if that bird, who used to be a fish, doesn't realize that it's a bird now and still thinks it's a fish because its mind hasn't been renewed, then that bird will get back into the water, back into its old life, begin to swim around, it'll dive, it'll drown, it'll die, and it'll never fly. Why? Because the bird didn't realize what it was after it had been transformed. When the Christian, or this bird, realizes what it already is, it will 
fly. The renewing of your mind is so important, and that's why Paul says in Romans 12 to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. But he was speaking to Christians when he wrote that. See, you must get born again. You must get saved. You must put your faith in Jesus first, and then you get born again. But then you step into this process of sanctification where your mind must be renewed by the washing of the word. And as your mind is washed by the water of the word so that you can come to understand what truth is, truth will set you free and bring a transformation to your life so that you can overcome sin even more. It's a beautiful thing. The gospel is about being liberated from the penalty, the power, and eventually the presence of sin, not just the penalty. So many times in Christendom, we just talk about how Jesus set us free from the penalty of sin, and then we say, go live how you want. That is not the gospel according to the Bible, if you really read it. And I encourage you to do that if you don't already. But guys, I hope that blessed you. Before you go, I really want to pray for Ben. I've done this in a couple of my video videos, but he's a very well-known figure and he talks about Judaism and he talks about Christianity a lot. And it would be epic if this guy came to know Jesus. And my prayer is that he will have an encounter just like Paul did, someone who is very zealous after Judaism but encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus and his life was totally transformed and he did a 180 and became a huge mouthpiece for God. And so if you would join me with praying for Ben right now. Lord, I just ask that you would open Ben's eyes. I just lift him up to you. I thank you that you love him like crazy, Lord. I ask that you pour out your grace upon him, your favor upon him, that you'd open up his eyes to see you, that you'd give him a moment like you gave with Paul. Lord, I ask that you would just grip his heart, open up his mind to understand the scriptures, open up his eyes to really see you for who you are, and make what's impossible for him to come to comprehend on his own possible through your ability to give him revelation. God, I ask that you would do it because only you, only you can, Lord. I ask that you do that. I ask that you'd save him. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you guys for sticking around. I hope this blessed you. There's so much more to say about some of the things that they were talking about, but I'm going to say that for, uh, for future videos. But until then, I love you guys. And until I see you next time together, let's soar.